positive experience for Kirkland Cleaners. Customers appreciate it. Uh, as a business owner, uh, my bottom line appreciates it. And then the city of Cambridge thinks it's wonderful because it's one of their biggest missions that they have is to reduce the carbon footprint here in the city. And to be able to help with that uh, makes me feel good as a business owner. And the big plus for everybody is that it is just much, much better for the environment. Have you received an eviction notice? Are you having problems with building management? Have you been denied for public housing? I am Nancy. We are the Alliance of Cambridge Tenants, the citywide organization of public housing voucher tenants. A city is tenants helping tenants, learning together and defending one another. Please call, do not hesitate. Help the homeless help themselves, lend your support. Buy spare change news from a vendor on the street and also donate to the Homeless Empowerment Project. We provide dignity and work to those who sell and write for the paper, help homeless and economically disadvantaged people demonstrate that with your support, they can affect positive changes in their lives. Please buy spare change news and donate to the address that appears on your screen. Thank you. Excuse me, begging your indulgence, sir. I'm a wealthy foreign dignitary and I would like your help moving a vast sum of money into this country. I, I would let you keep most of it, but I would like to have some of it back too. Please take this certified cashier's check as a portion of the transaction. Get lost. Scams like these don't work as well in person. That's why most of them are done online. Hello, my name is Patricia and I'm the owner of Kirkland Cleaners here in Cambridge, Massachusetts. And we've been in business for over 10 years now and we take energy efficiency very seriously. With that said, I'd like to show you around some of the projects that we've done here at Kirkland Cleaners. As a small business owner, it's not always easy to figure out how to go about and evaluate your business from an energy perspective. But by changing out our lighting, putting in more efficient um, uh, front load washing machines, and also changing out a 25 year old um, boiler system in the basement. And what was exciting about this is that. Hi there. <laughs> Amidst laughter, uh, welcome to another exciting edition of Cambridge Inside Out. My name is Robert Winters, and to my far left... My name is Susanna Sagat, and we have a very special guest tonight. Do you introduce yourself, please? Denise Simmons, Cambridge City Councilor, and happy to be here. Oh, we're so glad you're here. Glad to be here. Thank you so much. How are you doing, Robert? 
I'm much better, thank you. We, we missed sick. last week because I had the bubonic plague. Oh, no. But I'm very, very much on the mend now. <laughs> Are you contagious? Is that the I don't believe so. I believe I'm fine and you now. you can stay. This is why you're sitting in the middle today. That's oh, it. wow. Gosh, and I thought you liked me. It's all about protecting Susanna. <laughs> Right, so, good. as our viewers know, or should know, Councillor Simmons uh, has been re-elected to another term on the Cambridge City Council. Out of the nine people elected, she is the lone woman representative, so we're especially happy to have her here. Mm, You're carrying the weight of 53% of the population. How does yeah. it feel? Uh, you know, it's getting hard on my back, oh, it's, it's <laughs> even now, but uh, I'm, I think I'm going to be able to shoulder it. Oh, you That's definitely cool. can. But, you know, I'm not the interviewer, but at some point I, w I meant to ask Robert, when was the last time we've had just one woman? I, I don't know the answer to that. You know, I, um, goodness, I, somebody actually asked me that and I looked into it and had an answer, but I don't remember. Well, you know, this Something is the city to. where women were elected to office even before we had the right to vote. Absolutely, 18. We are so progressive and... I don't know what happened. I don't either. But thank goodness you're there. It's good to be there. Now, it's good to be there. So, shall we talk a little bit first? Well, I yeah. think there's great yeah. news. What's I think the, great the committee news? assignments have been the put up. The committee assignments. We want to talk about that. Yeah. But first, mm -hmm. if I may just say that yep. we were watching so diligently for the uh, mayoral election to happen, mm -hmm. and I want you to know that I speak for many people when I say. We were really proud of you that day when the elections Thank happened. You, you were you. a class act, and uh, a lot of people will remember that for a long time. So, <laughs> <laughs> well, for different reasons. <laughs> right. <laughs> no. um, yeah, so as Susanna mentioned, um, city council committees were appointed officially today, but um, Councillor Simmons actually played a significant role in the lead up to this. Mm -hmm. um, Tell us about did it. You were the chair or co-chair of a uh, co-chair, co-chair. Co you know, we had kind of talked about that. You know, sort of toward the end of the the co-chair of what the ad hoc committee on the council rules. Got it. So when at the inaugural meeting, one of the things you do is you vote the council rules, and so we did that provisionally. I brought in the order. Can we adopt them provisionally so we could have an opportunity to look at them with for, for me in part and I think a number of the members that we could look at the rules but also look at the committees how the committees worked and the role of the chair because we have four new members there's four new members that are not familiar with Robert's rules four new members that are not familiar with um, well, actually law. none of us are familiar with the open meeting law because it seems to be unfolding as we sit in meetings. It's a crazy law. Actually, it, it, it can I tell you work, something? You know? If we can digress for a minute. Let's we do it. That's okay. I, I watched the city council meeting last night from the comfort of my home. And you know, Robert, you are very visible in those meetings. I Whenever know. the, it's the, the it's city the, it's right. a bright light. No, when the city ma the manager mm -hmm. is uh, shown, it's like you're right there, right mm -hmm. behind him. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So you can't don't well, act up you know, or anything. I, I whisper into his ear, you know, so he it, knows it what shows. to say. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, I thought that uh, you and the other counselors who or long-term counselors there who were talking about the mm -hmm. committee report right. were very reasonable. It seems like people have gone over, like, uh, I can't even talk I anymore. I'm so distressed by it. This open meeting law. Yes. It's like people were contorting themselves trying to figure out how not to have conversations in public. Right. It, well, it, looked, it didn't look good. People are getting confused with transparency, right. you know, and access to a fault, you know. Um, if the, the idea of having committees of the council is so that some of the work can be done in a smaller environment right. where you invite people in, it's more relaxed, it's usually not under the camera, you really get a, ch a chance to vet an issue, then you bring it back to the council for further discussion and, right. you know, perhaps adoption. Now. I understand that some members might not know that because they're new and it all oh, the only exposure to the council is what they've seen on television. Uh, and so what I was hoping, it, it ended up all right in the end, but you're right, they didn't understand that to make a, col a committee of the whole was not going to make the committee more functional, it wasn't going to make us more transparent, uh, it, whatever transparent it means. You'd never be able to schedule a meeting. <laughs> You'd well, never be able to schedule a meeting, not to mention. But it's actually good to be able to hear the conversations the counselors are having, because then you get to understand the 
ups and downs of each of these possible laws or, or priorities. Well, did, do you have a better understanding? Because I think people walk to well, get confused. <laughs> when you hear well, the that, conversation, it's a lot easier. But that's, that's the absolutely the positive aspect of open meeting uh, procedures and laws. Mm -hmm. But under the current revisions of the law, I mean, I thought it, it really had reached the point of complete absurdity last night when they were talking about whether it would be possible if you had a quorum of two for a committee, if two people in the committee could talk about what they were planning to do at the meeting, to plan the meeting, and they were Well, you can told talk about logistics. You just can't talk about the substance of the, the meeting. The but the it, it is getting so restricted. Yeah. Folks are afraid to email. Uh, have a conversation with more than one person and what that really I think impedes and interrupts is collegiality yes. so I can't go to yeah, someone that's, that's sitting beside me without someone taking that as she approached the open meeting law because yeah. she turned to her colleague and said something and, and if a vote happens right after it I've really usurped the, the law and it's and that's not it there, there, there has to be a place where yeah. colleagues are able to come together and talk amongst themselves simple yeah. I, during the meeting, I actually walked over and whispered into Councillor Toomey's ear. I said, Tim, please talk to your friends in the legislature. Absolutely. Could you write a few exemptions here to allow for just basic, ordinary conversations so that, you know, it doesn't have to feel so burdensome? It's maintain the spirit of open meeting. Right. right. But, but, you know, enough little technical corrections to avoid these unintended consequences. Right. There's, there's nobody, I, I'm sure, when they were drafting the current version of this law, who had intended these types of consequences. And I'll tell you another thing, too, which is of all the hundreds of cities and towns in the state, somehow I had a feeling that, that uh, Cambridge might be one of the very few who are even having these troubles. Well, I don't, I don't mind people trying to stick to the law. You know, my favorite quote last night was when <coughs> Councillor Simmons says, you can talk to each other. It, it's just you have you do it in the you do it in a meeting. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, mm -hmm. it makes sense. And let me the the elephant in the room here. When there are subcommittee meetings, mm -hmm. how many people of the public actually show up? Depends on the time of the day and the topic. Right, and when they're usually set mm -hmm. up in a time where very few people come anyway. So it's not like you're talking in a group where it's such a huge audience where you're going to get in trouble for saying, I don't really know, can someone tell, explain it to me, right? And I think the council, yeah, that's a very good point. And I think the council is very sensitive to, the, to that. If there's something that's going, that there's been a lot of public outcry or concern or interest, those meetings tend to happen in the evening. But s ordinance committee meetings, and sometimes we're just at the beginning of the technicalities of it. Mm -hmm. So that's four o'clock in the afternoon. Also, you have to, remember that the staff often is called to some of these meetings so they've already had a long day and now we're asking them to be there for six seven oh, eight yeah. o'clock at, at night and, and so that has to be taken into consideration but you're you're very right by saying most committees of the council are meetings where we're really just trying to get information to formulate an opinion that we're going to send to the full council that they're going to then talk about on the floor at a regular meeting so the I, the public is i think a fairly ample opportunity to weigh in to listen and it might have been you that said one time someone said article and kutcher that said people public. confuse us all the time <laughs> gosh you're right it's both tall right um that public participation is at the nader local Civic, yeah the the uh, it's Abyss. I, <laughs> it ain't pleasure. like it used to is be. Is that the pleasure of the city council? There are some oh, city I councilors. See. That's much city better. Council, <laughs> there are some city councils, and I don't haven't had a lot of opportunity to go to council meetings. Sometimes when there's a conference and we go out of the, the state, if there's a council meeting, I might want to go to sit in it to see how it is. They have no public participation. You can't even come in the room without right. a badge. And so, and Cambridge is so much the other way. Oh, no, yeah. we're, we're, we're so much more like a like town meeting. Mm -hmm. You know, it's it's you know it's you know open mic night sometimes, and that's our tradition now. Mm -hmm. uh, so I, if, if anybody says that somehow we're restricting public process, I think that's completely missing the boat. <laughs> right. Honestly. Go someplace where they really exactly. Don't okay, I want to know what committees you got. Civic Unity. You're the chair of it. I'm the chair of the Civic Unity. And what does that mean? Well, Civic Unity is an offshoot of the Civic Unity Committee, which was a uh, department of the city that used to exist. Uh, from 1945 to 1992, and it really looked at issues of, the word they used was intergroup 
harmony, which is really a nice word, intergroup relations. And so you look at issues of fairness, race, class, equity issues, you know, for people of color, for women, for diverse populations. So I'm happy to be able to chair that again because we just had started to talk about um, lessons learned from the Montero case. And, and let me say this, lessons learned, not let's beat a dead horse, but how can we look at what had happened, what kind of things can we do so that it doesn't happen again? You know, what can we do to prevent the, the circumstance that led us to a very large payout? So, so well, I'm interested in continuing that one. The um, Gates situation is mm -hmm. about to hit its anniversary. I think it's this Having week. Having lived through it, I really no. no. No, Gates was in July. Oh, well, the, oh that's right. That's that's here in ago, July. Yeah. Okay. okay. Well, I no, we'll talk about back. that in July. Actually, okay, fine. You just, something you said just sort of because one other one other uh, thing about, that I know about you is that you're a very very major student of local history. Mm -hmm. And you mentioned uh, civic unity uh, being a was it actually a department? Or board. Yeah, was it, department? it was an apartment of the city. It was the, the first civic unity committee was appointed by the city manager named Atkinson back in Colonel 1945. Atkinson, yes. And he, it was basically an outgrowth of a citizens committee on intergroup understanding. They had about 45 members, and if you looked at them, they were clergy, a lot of university influence, and average citizens. Now here's the big question: mm. committees like that don't just sort of spontaneously come out of nothingness. There's usually some sort of a, a, a bad situation or a lingering condition mm -hmm. that um, spurs the, yep. the call for that. Do you, are you aware at all of what, what led to the creation of The that? Civic Unity Committee was not unique to Cambridge. There were about 40 across the oh, country. Okay. And they came out of the African American veterans coming back from World War II, not being able to get housing, not being able to get jobs, not being able to to get access to education, and so they sprung out. They were all some were called intergroup. I have a book I'll show you. Yeah, um, no, I'd love to. Some um, were called uh, inter committee on intergroup understanding. Some was committee on interracial understanding. But about five or six years ago, there was a PhD student that was actually trying to do research on it. I don't ever know what ever happened to him, but that was the outgrowth of it. I'd like to find out more about that. I think mm -hmm. that's an incredibly interesting story. And mm -hmm. something I've said, you know, there are lots of histories were written of Cambridge uh, in the 19th century, mm -hmm. but ridiculously little in the 20th century. And mm -hmm. well, the 21st is still kind of young. Yes. Right? <laughs> but, uh, you know, these types of histories are things that I think need to be added to the you know, the, the library of uh, Cambridge uh, well, histories. That, that's a nice segue to one of my favorite pet projects. <laughs> uh, one of a uh, pet project uh, that I think is wonderful and I'm very excited about is the whole idea of a Cambridge Museum. Uh, a, a What's that mean? A Cambridge Museum of History and, and Culture, which talk, tells the story, the, the past, of course, but also celebrates the present, the things that we do now, as well as the things that we did in the past. You know, it's to teach and to educate. So it's not all about exhibits and that kind of thing, but it's really about a place to come and talk about the, the civic unity and show some of the artifact, you know, artifacts that come from that. And there's so much rich history in people's homes that is just mm -hmm. being thrown in the trash. Let me yeah. give you a good example. You, you know Gus Solomon. No, you know I, Gus and, I, and I knew you were going to talk about that, too. I can tell. <laughs> <laughs> when he died, his sons, his wife had died. His, he, I, I don't know um, where he was at the time of his death, but he was not living in the house. The sons had left, and the house was sitting there, and the neighbor actually bought it. But I, I'm walking by, and there is his entire life on a table getting ready to go into a dumpster. Yeah. Wow. And so it, it, it was just so, so rich. The, the um, couple of things, one of it was a, a dial, of a, a rotary phone, which I have, because <laughs> there was no place to put it. Um, lots of newspapers, articles. His wife, Olivia Solom Stead Solomon, she was a Stead, um, had a lot of information. She was a teacher. And so she had a, a ton of information, but he had the blueprint for the original Ringe School of Technical Arts. Yeah. He had that. And uh, you have a book that's here. I have a few books. Right, but he had a whole <laughs> 12 volumes of the books of, of the city ah, in okay. his house. I guess at one time, if you were a member of the city, city council or school committee, you would get one of these books. And so he had about 12 of those. One of my particular passions is picking. These are the, just sort of, sort of a boring person I really am. This is the, uh, I can barely read it, Annual Documents, City of Cambridge, 1938. 
I went like from 1920. I have, oh, well, I've gone from 1906. Oh, really? Is that 18, because I went through the map? 1882. Okay. Oh, sure. You two talk amongst yourself. <laughs> Sorry. No, see, see, we, we were definitely separated at birth absolutely. here because we, we absolutely shared. Where this, did you uh, get these? Well, I, they're everywhere. You I can get you. I, I, I pick them up on eBay whenever I can find them. Oh, you and I have to hang out. I love it. And, but you can come along. I, I, thank you because I was feeling really <laughs> lucky. Actually, there's a member of the, one of the East Cambridge uh, down the fire department. Um, he contacted me because I guess he must have figured I was bidding on it on eBay or something like oh, that. Oh, you were. And he wanted to get copies of the um, the fire department reports from some of the old reports. So I was, you know, scanning them and making them available to them. No, it's really interesting um, information. And what's interesting about Olivia Stead Solomon was, you know, she was a teacher when it was not all that easy to be a, a teacher and and very active woman, and um, not only in her church, which was Rosh Hashanah Zion, but also in the city. So it, it just was a lot of rich history. And that's oh, where yeah. I was going. And where is that? place. I collect all this information. I went to the library. They wouldn't take it. Why? They had no way to keep it. Well, they're taking a lot more of it now. Right, because they have a new building. Yeah, but when I got the it, there was room. no, you have to keep archives in a certain temperature. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Otherwise, it kind of goes poof. But so I just say that to say, uh, so I look forward to this this museum because it's not that we, we don't have historical commission, but they're, they're not set up necessarily for visitors to come in and manipulate yeah. the files and touch and feel. And we have a historical society that is very, very um, um, important, but it's really the history going to the early years of Cambridge to about the 1900s. Well, I want some place where you can find some of the current history as well. And so now I, I'm would this very, require a physical location? It will at some point. It yeah. will. Yeah, I mean, this is, this is a project I'd love to see happen at some point. Um, you know, but Me then again, too. you know, <laughs> right. it's a pers personal. So how are you doing it? History. How um, are you going to make this happen? Well, um, I mean, if anyone can do it, you can. So how is this <laughs> going to happen? We start with a committee. We start with a, a public process to talk about. Let's envision a, a museum. What would it look like? Where yeah. could it be? What would we want in it? Because it really should be participatory, so that when it does come to fruition, people are already engaged. Yeah, I mean, yeah. if you had some sort of facility that was sort of part museum and part sort of public forum where you could have ongoing presentations and discussions every week, every month, or whatever, mm -hmm. uh, you know, where people can actually share that. There's so many people who are living in Cambridge now and liking living here who right. have no idea what this history and that's where the And that's where the education comes in. Because and who might actually want to know. And right. might actually want to know. <laughs> <laughs> Well, we're trying to work up that interest. We'll, we're doing our best. Yeah, to you're doing a good job. So we'll, we'll, we'll go with you and go from there. About that. Actually, let me, let me say, because we were talking earlier about city council committees. So I actually looked up in my 1938 book. Mm -hmm. cause, uh, Where we'll, there were no women. <laughs> <laughs> no, just say Is the, that the, true? On the council in 1930? Okay, let me look. No, the, I think Pearl Wise was the first. But she wasn't was in the 30s. No, that right? was not in the 30s. It was the 40s. That yeah, was in the late 40s. She yes. came in the 40s. Yeah. When was it? The, uh, no, she, there's, 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 there's a ton of women. I mean, there were I women have, on the school committee. I have a right, list yeah. of women, of which you are on, uh, talking about women's service from 1880 mm -hmm. to the present. But the city council women came far later. Right. Looking from the plan each charter going I see. forward, right. you really start to see the women's presence. But right. prior to that, you don't see them. Um, and you're right. It may, there may have been one person before Pearl Wise. Um, there was Florence Stanley. I actually knew this once, and I've forgotten it. It would help to have that library. Yeah, <laughs> that's right, absolutely. Good museum. But now, just just, uh, just to sort of go back a little bit, when you were talking about the appointment of the new city council committees, the, the big change, well, the biggest change, as far as I'm concerned, was the reduction from 17 standing committees down to 11, which mm -hmm. I think makes a lot of sense. Which was the recommendation of the committee, that right? Was, that's right. The special right. committee. That's, that's exactly what you right. wanted that. But, you know, what, the only thing I thought well, could also have happened but didn't quite happen was um, also sort of a redefinition of committees that focus on different topic areas, though I had no particular suggestions. So when you say redefinition, because when we put the committees together, we didn't take the definition of the work that the committees do. We didn't change right. that. But, it was, but we did combine. It, it was consolidation. Yes. But it, was it, wasn't, it wasn't creating anything new. But That's the, committee, the next committee. The committees as they stand today are, have not always been. I mean, Neighborhood and Long-Term Planning Committee, I think, was invented about 10, maybe, maybe 14 years ago. It was uh, there when I got there, yeah, so but it was it just before be. you, and uh, there were other ones that Well, had, Civic Unity didn't, didn't come into 1992. Yeah, exactly. 
So, you know, there, there's some changes. So uh, we'll probably have to do this in the, maybe pick up in the second half of the program. But I was, it was interesting. I, mean, I was looking back in 1938. There mm -hmm. were 23 standing committees. Oh, I will not go through the entire the list. Oh, oh, that's a lot of I'm No, I'm not going to. But, I would just, but one of the things I want to say just Don't to show you. Don't read them all. No, I'm not going to. <laughs> but just to show you sort of the changing uh, emphasis mm -hmm. uh, for the city. So 75 years ago. One of the standing committees of the Cambridge City Council was the Committee on Americanization and Education. Hmm. Well, Americanization. <laughs> I don't think we could get away with that today. <laughs> so, but, yeah. but you know, there was city planning, claims committee. There was one called elections and printing. You might need elections again. <laughs> yeah, but, but no, it's it's interesting thing. If you have a committee, a standing committee on elections and printing, I don't think it's any accident that the city used to actually publish interesting things. Mm -hmm. Because there was right. standing committees that actually focused on mm -hmm, things like mm -hmm, that, mm -hmm. you know. So I don't know. Maybe well, I'm looking over show. It says there was a committee on public service. A uh, committee on public service. I, one committee I thought maybe sh I here's, Bring it a, back. here's a thought. You know, maybe we should have a committee on public works. How often do people come in and want to talk about roads and this and sidewalks mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. all sorts of things having to do with sort of public infrastructure like uh, that. Yeah. I think maybe that would probably get... Where do get, they do that now? It'd probably get sent off to public facilities utilities. or something, utilities. But I think it probably would go into yeah. public utilities, not quite a match, but you'd have to, you're trying to figure out a place to put it. Yeah, exactly, exactly. But anyway, my that's only point was That's an interesting idea. Yeah, yeah, you know, I think maybe, you know, we'll, let's well, form we another ad hoc we committee. We can't <laughs> add a committee until we take another one away, clearly. Exactly, right. No, this is just sort of for forward thinking for future years, mm -hmm. is that, mm -hmm. you know, this, there may be some place for actually redefining uh, committees. Uh, uh, it's my uh, hope that every, at the top of every um, term, we kind of do that introspection. Yeah, it would be a good thing. You know, what are we doing? Do we need a committee on whatever it is that we have? You know, is it meeting? Is anyone signing up for it? There's some committees people don't even sign up for. You don't that's want it. It. so it. if if it's not being uh, it's if it's not being asked for and, and then when it is it doesn't have a meeting then maybe you don't need it. Well, right. we barely touched the surface. I know you're I going to, to stay. Back. We'll have you back. All of you can go have a snack. Come back in three minutes, and we'll be right back with you with our special guest Denise Simmons. A snack. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> this is Cambridge Inside. Out.